Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Haydn Symphony Crusade, and we're up to symphony number 32. This is a four-movement symphony in C major. It's an early symphony, but it has several fascinating features, as do all of the Haydn symphonies that we've encountered so far. Gosh, the guy is just unbelievable in the variety and constantly new and enchanting ideas that he comes up with. So, what are the unique features of Symphony Number no. 32? First of all, because it's in C major, Haydn has horns and trumpets, and those horns are in what we call C alto. Alto means high. The opposite of alto is basso, as in bass, bottom. C alto horns are in their high, high, high register. And combined with the C trumpets, you get just this incredibly cutting, brilliant, really loud, actually. It must have been incredibly loud back in the day. Very loud sound. It was incredibly loud back in the day because A, trumpeters particularly were not normally orchestral musicians. They played like in the town watchtower and announced the time or they played the post horn and the mail was coming, announcing it from afar, or they were in the military, or if you were a horn player, you accompanied the hunt when you were running around with a pack of dogs and you had to find the fox and tell everybody where to go to catch the thing or the deer or whatever they were hunting. They played loud. They were not known for their subtlety. And so even where composers marked things to be played piano, God only knows what they would have done. So that's one reason it would have been loud. It would also have been loud because they played for teeny tiny audiences. Remember Haydn's orchestra, which had, you know, something less than 20 people in it most of the time, um, performed in a very small room for, it could have been just the prince who wanted to hear a symphony or the prince and his friends. It could have been a, a, a group of people smaller than the number of people in the orchestra who they were playing for, but they were very close to them. They were all sitting in a living room, basically. I mean, they were large rooms. It was a Cavs of Palace, you know, we're not talking about, you know, a, a New York apartment style living room, you know, just a few hundred square feet. I mean, these were large rooms, but by concert hall standards, they were very small. And stuff a 20 piece orchestra with trumpets and horns and timpani in one of these teeny tiny rooms with a, a 10 or 12 person string section and a couple of oboes and a bassoon and maybe a keyboard on the bottom. And you're going to have the potential for some very, very strange balances. And I think that I think that probably the actual sound of these things was such that we wouldn't even be able to tolerate them today. They would have sounded so so completely off kilter. Now, we don't know what Haydn actually intended um, entirely, but we do know what he wrote. And of course, what he wrote was for the music to be properly balanced and and everything in proportion and, you know, with dynamics pretty carefully marked most of the time. So so what what he wrote and what they got are basically two completely separate things. But the point is that these symphonies with with horns in, in C alto, in high C, was an Esterhaza specialty. It is a specialty of Haydn's writing in the key of C major. And it's one of the things that makes the music so distinctive. It's also a method of binding the pieces together. Symphonically, one of the things that we've been talking about in these crusades is how Haydn is able to use timbre, the sound of instruments, to create unity in a four movement work without having to actually quote themes between movements. What they can share is a sound, and that sound is the high C, the horns in high C with trumpets and drums. And that sound permeates three of the four movements of this symphony. So we already have a unified piece within the symphonic meaning of the term. And, and truly, Haydn doesn't have to do anything else, although he does, as you'll see. But basically, he doesn't have to do anything else. His biggest concern in this particular piece is to create contrast. And the reason that's so important, it's so important in these C major works, is because the trumpets and drums, even in high C, they, they're playing in this high pitch because they have more usable notes in that range. 
because in the days before instruments had valves, you know, they were only able to play in certain keys. And they only had certain notes that would be in tune in those keys. And so the composer was terribly limited in, as to when, when he or she could use those instruments. Most of the time, they're limited to rhythmic fanfares and things. Haydn had a very special rhythm. His rhythm was bump, ba -da dump, bump, bump. That's the Haydn rhythm. It's also the Mahler rhythm, by the way. They both loved that rhythm. But Haydn's rhythm was dun, da da dum bum bum. That was, it, it appears in everything he wrote, um, and quite often when he has trumpets and drums, because that's just about all that they can do. Mozart had a different rhythm. Mozart's rhythm was dum, bum, ba bum. It was a slower, more stately march rhythm. And that occurs in millions of Mozart pieces in preference to the Haydn rhythm, which, of course, they both sometimes used each other's rhythms. They were not proprietary, but they used them frequently enough that they became identified with their music. So the trumpets and drums and horns do a lot of Haydn rhythm stuff, but also it means that the main themes, the ones in which they participate, are going to be based on simple notes of accord, arpeggios and triads, da, 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 you know, simple, simple, the, the, the basic notes that the instruments have. So when that happens, and you're using them in three out of four movements, in order to prevent fatigue, oral fatigue, you know, and the music from getting dull or tiring um, or, or bothersome to the ear, especially at high volume, he has to do things. He wants to do things to create as much contrast as possible in moments when those instruments are not playing. So what we need to do when we listen to the symphony is pay particular attention, first of all, to those episodes that are not in C major. You'll find that whenever Haydn can, he'll veer off into a minor key, which not only creates a marvelous contrast with the very simple triadic you know, arpeggios, simple chord structures of the other themes, because in minor keys, you've got more notes that you can use, and it creates a, a, an entirely different mood, and it's usually for strings only. And the other thing that Haydn does quite remarkably in this symphony is he changes the order of the inner movements. This is one of the very, very few Haydn symphonies in which the minuet comes second instead of third. So we have a quick movement, the minuet, the slow movement, and then the finale. And that has serious consequences, as you might imagine. One of the consequences is, is that it emphasizes the slow movement, which is written for strings alone, and which is very rich textured for this early period in Haydn. You know, it's not just a simple tune and accompaniment. The strings are contrapuntally busy, and there's a lot of richness and, and, and ornamentation and decoration to the writing to make it sound very full and give it some meat. You know, he puts real substance on its, on its bones, even though it's just for strings. And the other thing that this does is that both the minuet and the finale are, are in triple time. The minuet, because it's a minuet, is in three, four time. And, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three. The finale is in a, it's one of those rollicking sort of sea chanty kind of tunes that Haydn wrote. But those are usually in either three, eight or six, eight. It's sort of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But the, the sense you get is that of triple time, like a fast waltz or even like the minuet itself. So putting the slow movement between them prevents monotony. Remember, the, the classical ideal is always, everyone says that, you know, you, when you read about these things, about the classical period, they talk about classical proportions. And you, you look at pictures of Greek buildings with columns evenly spaced and nice little, you know, porticos and things like that. And the whole idea is proportion and elegance. And yes, they have that. But that's not the point in the music. It's really not. The point in the music was contrast. It was to pack as much variety into the music over its short span as you possibly could. At least that was Haydn's goal. And that's what Haydn does. He wants variety of rhythm. He wants variety of texture. He wants variety of harmony and tonality. And so the entire symphony, while being unified by the timbre of the trumpets and drums, is going to be designed so as to create contrast, to keep you guessing, to keep it fresh, to keep everything moving. 
That's what Haydn's doing. That's what the classical style does. I think we, we, we terribly misjudge our descriptions of the classical style by emphasizing things such as regularity and uniformity when, when none of those things apply to Haydn in any, in, to any marked degree. Haydn is all about variety and contrast. So, so let's, let's get that straight beginning and then now, now we can listen to some of the music. So let's listen to the first movement without repeats. And as I said, as I said, pay particular attention to contrasting sections where the trumpets and drums are not playing. This, by the way, is a particularly brilliant performance, a marvelous performance with the Cologne Chamber Orchestra under Helmut Müller Bruhl. And boy, he really lets those trumpets and horns play out, which makes it very, very exciting. And you'll see what I mean. When you hear this, you're not going to think, oh, Greek portico. No, no, no. You're not going to hear that at all. So here is the first movement of Haydn's Symphony Number no. 32 on Naxos in C major. Go, guys. <laughs> second movement is the minuet, as I mentioned, but I'm not going to play with that right now. What I want to focus in the minuet is the trio section, which is entirely in a minor key. It's very dark. In some ways, it's the, in terms of the, the emotional and expressive intensity of the piece, it's the heart of the work. It really is. And it's, all, it's always fascinating in Haydn because middle sections of minuets, trio sections, with most composers are normally just throw away uninteresting episodes of contrast between the return of the minuet on either end. Not with Haydn. Haydn saves some of his most fascinating music for the trio section, the middle section, as it's called, of the minuet. And this one is really dark. I mean, remarkably dark, considering its surroundings. And it really, it really is sort of gives gives the whole different cast to the symphony expressively. So I want to play you the entire trio with its repeats. All of these, these dance sections have AABB forms, and you may or may not repeat those 
A and B sections, but in this case, I want you to hear the repeats just because the music itself is so interesting and so completely contrasted from the very formal C major pomp and ceremony that surrounds it in the minuet. So here is the trio section of the minuet. Totally, totally other, isn't it? Compared to what we just heard, for example, in the first movement. But that minor key thread is also going to run through all four movements. And so that will be something that Haydn also uses to unify the four movement cycle of the symphony. It's not just trumpets and drums. I mean, Haydn operates on multiple levels at all times. So we come to the slow movement now, which is for strings only, as I indicated. And there's another wonderful thing about it, which is that the themes of the minuet and the slow movement come from the same sort of family. They sound similar. I'm not quite sure why or how. I have to be honest. I, I haven't like analyzed it. Just hearing them played one after the other, I get this sense that they're somehow related. They're related in their shape in their sort of family resemblance. And I, I made a little clip here of the opening of the minuet, which we hadn't, haven't heard yet, and then the opening of the slow movement. And you can hear that, that relatedness. And I think it's really very interesting to note because one of the things that, that musicology or music theory in, in analyzing these pieces has difficulty dealing with is that idea of just of similarity. It's an audible thing. It's not a paper thing. It's not something that you see, you know, when you look at a score or even play it necessarily on a piano. It's when you hear the music the way the composer wrote it and the right speed and you say, oh, that somehow sounds familiar. It's a mysterious quality, but this symphony has it and it has it in these two movements that sort of mark them apart as the middle movements of the symphony, which are together somehow. So let me play you the opening of the minuet, then there's a little pause, then you'll hear the opening of the slow movement, and you'll, you'll, I think you'll hear what I mean. I, I do think so. Maybe not, but uh, that was my impression anyway. And everybody has their own impression, but it's always nice when they're shared. Here you go.
And last but not least, we have the rollicking finale, which is only a little bit more than two minutes long with all of its repeats. So I'm going to play the whole thing. <laughs> you should just sit back and enjoy it. And again, one of the things that's fascinating about this finale is the way Haydn takes every opportunity he can to divert the music into a minor key. And this is not tragic minor key. We have to be clear. You know, the idea of doing this is not, is not to be sad. The idea of doing this is to be other. It's to be different. It's to provide contrast. It's to make the main tune, which is as simple as possible. It's just dum bum 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 but it bum 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 I mean it's like it's like a nursery tune. It's so simple. So he wants that to sound fresh every time it comes back. And the way to get it to sound fresh is to is to intersperse episodes with as much contrast as possible. So the, the minor key in this case does not serve to make the music, you know threatening or miserable. It's not, there's no danger of the music becoming suddenly tragic. It's spice. It's the paprika in the goulash, if you want to call it. That is the thing. It's the thing that keeps the music always sounding new and, and vivacious and full of, of, an, of an extra amount of, of, of expressive depth that it otherwise just wouldn't have. And it keeps the minor key from the major key, that is the trumpet and drum parts from sounding sort of facile and 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 childish which they very in a lot of symphonies of this period they do when you hear trumpet and drum things you know the music becomes terribly formulaic because of the limitations of the instruments and the limitations in the brains of the composer writing for those instruments but Haydn has no such limitations and so we can enjoy this finale and the rest of the symphony for all of the wonderful variety and contrast he brings to it while still maintaining the overall aura of pomp and ceremony and celebration and festivity. So here is the finale. <laughs> That was Helmut Müller Brühl with the Cologne Chamber Orchestra giving us Haydn Symphony Number no. 32 in C major, 
part of our Haydn Symphony Crusade. So keep on listening, folks. I'm looking forward to Symphony Number no. 33, and I hope you are too. Take care. <laughs>